Hey guys, what's up? John from FlyMikeAlpha.com and I'm here today to walk you through the instrument panel on our Piper Warrior here. So every single button and switch, what it does, how it affects us, what it's connected to, we're going to go ahead and name every single thing here. So for starters, we've got our clock. Our clock runs off of 12 volt DC power, so it's just running off the battery. And it's not going to run the battery down. I mean, it would take years and years for it to do that. It's using very little electricity. The battery will go bad on its own long before that happens. So just directly connect to the battery. keeps running 24-7 even with the master switch off. So it's not connected to uh, one of the buses that's connected directly to the battery. Next is our airspeed indicator. It, of course, indicates our airspeed. It works off of the pitot tube and the static port. So air pressure comes in through the lines through the pitot tube, presses on a little wafer inside there, and then it measures the differential pressure between that and the static port and indicates your airspeed. So it's just purely off of airflow to the pitot tube, not electric, not uh, powered by anything. It will work with the master switch off. It'll work just by blowing into the pitot tube. Not that you'd want to do that because you'll probably destroy the instrument. But uh, just with airflow or air pressure against the pitot tube, that will start to indicate a airspeed. Next instrument is our attitude indicator. It is a gyro instrument. We've got a spinning gyro inside there and it is vacuum powered. So if you lose vacuum, then you're going to lose this instrument. It's vacuum powered off of an engine driven vacuum pump. Therefore, it's only gonna have vacuum when the engine's running, not master switch. It's an engine driven vacuum pump on this airplane and many small airplanes. Next, altimeter. Altimeter works just off the static port. That's the only thing, not electric or hydraulic or anything like that. It's purely based off the static port. So just the air pressure, the ambient air pressure is going to come through the static port, through a static line to the altimeter and indicate an altitude to us. Next, we've got two VORs here. The VORs have these OBS knobs and we won't go too much in depth into the VORs, but they are electric. They are connected to your nav radios and that is powered off your master and your avionics switches. Down here, vertical speed. So vertical speed is purely off of your static port and it's just basically a calibrated leak. So as the ambient air pressure is changing, uh, what rate it changes then indicates the vertical speed in how many uh, feet per minute you are climbing or descending. We've got our DG, that is another gyro instrument and it is powered off of the engine driven vacuum pump. So it's getting uh, the uh, vacuum pressure to spin the gyro, uh, or vacuum suction rather, from the engine driven vacuum pump. If the vacuum pump fails, that's gonna just basically freeze in place and not turn at all. Next over here, we have an engine analyzer. Pretty cool, it tells us our EGT and CHT, and we'll also show you how that works with all the wires, but basically it's just telling you the four EGTs and the four C CHTs on the engine. It's powered electrically, so it comes on with our master switch being turned on. So we can see here under the engine cowling where we have these wires running through, all these yellow wires, that's our engine analyzer and they're coming down here and coming to these little probes that are actually inside of the exhaust pipe. So they've actually screwed a hole through the exhaust, sealed it off again, and then with a hose clamp attached that little probe to each individual exhaust pipe. So you're getting EGT from each exhaust from each cylinder. They also have probes for the CHTs, and you can see they're a little further back there, right in here, without burning myself, hopefully. That is our CHT probe, so it's directly into the cylinder head to get your cylinder head temperature for each cylinder on the engine. We can see the other one back there behind the spark plug and behind the intake. We've got our turn coordinator over here. That is a gyro instrument, but it is electric, so it comes on with the master switch. And that is a backup function, basically. It's not powered with vacuum suction because they want you to have some sort of gyro instrument still working to indicate whether you're level or if you're in a turn, if you're to lose your engine-driven vacuum pump and lose your other two gyro instruments. So if you lose your engine-driven vacuum pump, these two fail but this one should still work as long as you have electrical power. Coming down here, we have our ELT control panel, so we can either turn it on or reset it. Or uh, if you wanna turn it on but without using this, then you just have to land really, really hard, also known as a crash, that will also activate the ELT. And you should see a little red light come on when that ELT gets activated, provided that you don't actually sever the cable going from the ELT in the tail up to this little red light, 
in that thing that we call a crash. A little further down there, we have an old EGT. That's just a single place EGT, and we'll talk about that when we look underneath the cowling, but instead of having four wires going to four different exhaust pipes, that was just a single wire going to one exhaust pipe, just to give you a rough idea what the EGT was on the engine. Really just an instrument that we use for leaning. Down here, we have a switch for electric pitch trim. So we actually have uh, trim that is on the control yoke, and we can turn that on and off with that switch there. If it started to run away on us or something like that, we could quick reach down there and turn it off to stop the electric trim from uh, trimming the airplane in a way we didn't want it to. We have our mag switch down here, off, right, left, both, and start. We all know how that works, and we'll look at the uh, wires going to the mags when we look underneath the cowling there. Tachometer, it works off a spinning cable that comes through from the actual engine all the way through the firewall to this instrument. So as the engine turns, it then turns the inside of this instrument with a little magnet inside there, and it indicates our engine RPM to us, as well as keeping track of our total time airframe. It's important to note that if you fly the airplane, say at 2,500 RPM for one hour, this will then indicate that you flew for one hour. But if you have the airplane run at say half that, at 1,250 RPM for an hour, it's gonna indicate half of an hour. So it's actually indicating time as a percentage of RPM, with the theory being that higher RPMs mean more wear and tear on the engine. So your maintenance is based off tack time. So your 100 hour and things like that, the total time on the engine, when you see 4,000 hours on an engine, well, that's not 4,000 hours on the clock, that's probably 4,500 hours or 5,000 hours on the clock because for some of that time, it was running less than the designated cruise setting. Coming up here, we have fuel gauges. All the fuel gauges are electric. We have little uh, float sensors in our tanks. And so we have a left and a right fuel gauge. We have oil pressure and we have fuel pressure. These gauges here are actually powered off of lines that come from, through the firewall from the engine. So we actually have oil flowing to this gauge here and we have fuel flowing to this gauge here. If you were to disconnect those lines or break those lines underneath the cowling or underneath the instrument panel here, you would have fuel or oil leaking on your feet. Over here we have our primer. The primer just sucks in a little bit of fuel and squirts it directly into the intake to help the engine start. Now if we take a look at the other side of the engine here, we'll see where our fuel line runs from the carburetor. So we have the carburetor down there at the bottom of the engine and we have this orange fuel line here coming off and teed off of this fuel line we have this copper pipe, and that pipe runs through, I'll follow it with my finger here, right along here, along the firewall, back behind the brake reservoir, and eventually through the firewall to our fuel pressure gauge. So we actually have Avgas in the cockpit with us. This skinny little line here, coming off of the fuel system, is actually going to your primer. So that goes in the cockpit, so then you can pump fuel from inside the cockpit with the primer. It comes back out and goes directly into the intake side. So we can see where our skinny little copper pipe comes back up here where we'd shoot fuel directly into the intake side. It's our intake pipe there for that particular cylinder. So we're putting fuel directly to the cylinders to help it start easier. So we have a primer on that cylinder. We also have one over on that cylinder. It looks like they're on all four cylinders in this engine. Some engines only have the primer on one or two cylinders, and that's why it's harder to get them to start or easier to flood them, where you have some cylinders with fuel in them and others without fuel initially. We have our throttle. We have our mixture control. And we have carburetor heat over here on the side. This lever here adjusts the friction in our throttle. Here we can turn on our nav lights or dim them. We can control the brightness of our panel lights. We have pitot heat, which is electronic. It electrically heats the pitot tube. We have our anti-collision light, electric. We have our landing light, also electric, of course, and our fuel pump that is electric. So we have an engine-driven fuel pump, plus we have this electric fuel pump that we run for critical phases of flight, like takeoff and landing, as a redundant backup. Then, of course, our master switch split between alternator and battery. So if we turn on just the left half, we get our battery. If we turn on the right half, it energizes the alternator, but we are obviously aren't uh, running the engine right now, so we're not gonna get any power off that. Up here, we have a few lights. These are warning lights. They're powered electronically, and we could test them. If they weren't on, we could press to test them with that little press to test switch, just to make sure that they're in fact not burnt out. And they're simply just sensing low vacuum pressure, low voltage alternator, or low oil pressure. Here we have our comm panel, so we could select to transmit and receive comm one or comm two, or external, as we turn that switch. We could select where we want to hear COM1 on the speaker, or we could hear it through our headset, COM2, so we could flip this down to phone there. We could monitor COM2 while we're still transmitting and receiving on COM1. 
we have nav one and two, we could listen to those to positively identify things like the VOR stations and hear that through our headset, or we could flip them up and we'd hear it through the speaker and so on with your ADF, DME, and markers. We have our radios, and those are, of course, powered electronically. And we have our transponder down here, which there's a little bit more than meets the eye to the transponder. We have, of course, this transponder unit where we can type in our code. And then there's also, it's tied into our static system, so it knows our ambient pressure, so it can report mode C, our altitude, our pressure altitude to air traffic control. And there's also an altitude encoder that actually runs to the static system, and it's a separate little box behind the panel. We can't see it from here. So there's another part to this transponder that can go bad and that could be malfunctioning. So it may not be this box specifically that's malfunctioning if it's giving a bad altitude ATC. It's maybe that little altitude encoder box. And of course we have the ident button there. We could have it in off, standby mode to keep to uh, start warming it up, on just to show ATC the code, or alt to show ATC the code plus the altitude we're at. Over here we have our intercom. So we can uh, change the squelch, so when it'll start picking up our voices, and volume, and then our on-off switch. We have a very old-school GPS RNAV uh, unit here, followed by another very old-school GPS. We're not going to talk too much about those, just that they're electronic, uh, because they vary so much between different airplanes. Of course, we have our dreaded Hobbs meter. That's controlled when we turn on our master switch. It provides power, and then we have an oil pressure switch that closes the circuit and then supplies electricity to start running that clock, and that clock is a normal clock. So one hour of time with the engine on at any RPM reads one hour on here compared to the tack where it runs as a percentage. We have our suction instrument. That's just a direct line, a vacuum line going right to the vacuum lines teed in with your vacuum instruments, like your attitude indicator and your uh, DG down there to indicate how much suction the vacuum pump's putting out and to make sure that it's adequate to actually spin those dyros fast enough. We have a 12 volt cigarette lighter and we have cabin heat and defrost. So we could start to heat the cabin with airflow at our feet or we could turn on the defrost to uh, blow some moisture or fog off the windshield. Down here we have all of our circuit breakers. So we've got a uh, switch for strobe lights. We've got all the circuit breakers that of course if they were to blow they would pop out and then we could reset it. They typically say if it blows in flight to reset it once and then to leave it alone after that you don't want to continuously be resetting them because you'll probably end up causing electrical fire. It's probably tripping constantly because there's some sort of short you need to let it blow or pop out to cut off electricity to the faulty component. And lastly over here we have our amp meter. So the amp meter is just indicating if we're charging or not. Once we uh, start the engine and we have both parts of the master switch on then we should uh, go ahead and see a charge here when the engine's running. If we don't see a positive indication here, then that's indicative of the alternator not working, along with probably getting that alt light to warn us of low voltage. And thanks so much for watching, guys. If you have any questions on this at all, leave them in the comments box below. We'd be more than happy to answer them for you. Make sure you check out our Patreon page. We greatly appreciate all the support you guys give us. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So give us a thumbs up here. Subscribe to our channel. Keep up on our latest episodes as they come out each week. If you have more questions about private pilot things, check out our free online ground school at flyatmikealpha.com. Lots of other online courses there too, besides just the private pilot one. All sorts of courses for all sorts of pilots. As always, guys, if you cannot fly every day, then flyatmikealpha.com. We will see you all next time.